human beings, we're wired to be connected. From birth, we look for that connection. Where internet connectivity ends and a non-connected society exists, the desire exists to be connected. Once they find connectivity, this city starts to grow. It grows first from an educational perspective. No longer can the top three goals of education be reading, writing, and arithmetic. Now I truly believe that they need to be relationships, relationships, relationships. Exploration is not a bucket list where you simply check off places that you have been. You need to realize that you are in a frontier and there's always new discoveries to be made, oftentimes just by changing the way you make the observation. You're exercising a muscle here. Every time you exercise empathy and that's emotional intelligence. Continue that curiosity, ask questions. Because of that respect and my willingness to listen and his willingness to listen to me, he ended up leaving the clan and there's his robe right there. And the reality is that we don't really know how it's going to look and what it's about. So many people are looking for feeding their spiritual hunger. The human nature gap is real. The human nature gap is having ramifications. If we take an idea and then we embrace it, challenge our belief systems, challenge our perspectives. And today we're going to take one step beyond and we're going to go that way and just seek new ideas. Good evening, TEDx Naperville. I am Arthur Zards, your curator and host for TEDx Naperville. Welcome to one of our virtual salons. Uh, I'm excited. Uh, for we have a very special guest this evening. Uh, today we're going to get interactive uh, with uh, everything that's been going on in this world. TEDx Naperville is going to continue to strive to get past Zoom fatigue. Nobody wants to sit behind a computer when they've been sitting behind a computer all day long. And we're going to experiment today with getting interactive. And before we get there, I'd like to thank our sponsor. If Jonathan, you want to pull up our sponsor uh, banner, I'd like to thank Lab Z. This event is powered by Lab Z which is an organization that takes boring Zoom conferences, online conferences, and makes them interactive, uh, just like tonight. So if you're curious about getting interactive, uh, it's uh, curious at labz.io or just labz.io. Today, to get interactive, we're going to be doing something with an app called Poll Everywhere. If you saw the MailChimp that we sent out today, you have a link to download the app on the Google Play or the Apple Store. Uh, feel free to download it while we're talking. The link is up on the screen right now. If you don't have the app, the app is free. You can, I'm going to move my window here. Sorry, my camera is in the way. You can also use your web browser by going to pollev.com slash jonathanruff127. We're going to have this on the screen for a little bit. And as I'm talking and introducing the guest, feel free to go to the polling app right now. And if you have the app, you actually go to jonathanruff127. And there's a trivia question you can answer, and that'll be up for another minute or two while we get settled in before our, our guest arrives. And our guests will be using this application to help guide the conversation. Uh, our speaker has so many ideas that he's gonna be using this app to help guide where the conversation goes. So you will be di directly in charge of how the conversation develops. 
And another thing I do want to mention, I want to thank our crew. Jonathan, if you want to pop in real quick and just say hi. So we have a producer running the show, and that's Jonathan Ruff, and he is in – he's pulling him in. He's in Nashville. Say hello. hello. How are you? And I just want to make sure everybody knows that this salon is not just me. Jonathan is running the entire production in Nashville, and he was originally from Naperville. We have Liz, who's behind the scenes running the Slack channels. We have James, who's done the design. We have Michelle, who's doing the marketing. We have Yuan, who's doing social media. We have Jody with partnerships. We have a whole crew that's putting on this production. So it's not just me waking up, pushing a button, and talking to people. Uh, there's a good number of people that are putting this show on, and unfortunately, you don't always get to see their face. So the quick housekeeping, TEDx Naperville is happening this year on November 14th, which is a Saturday. It will be virtual. But when I say virtual, this is not the virtual. For, and for people that know, they know about how TEDx Naperville operates. When we say virtual, it's going to be much more than virtual. Think about uh, interactive. Think about things that you're not expecting. It's going to be different. Uh, it's going to be probably at half a day. More details will be coming soon. But it is going to be very interactive. And it's not going to be the typical boring virtual conference that everybody's been to that you just click that you're there. And then you just go get a cup of coffee and you ignore it. This one will be very interactive. I do want to announce that we do have another salon that's going to be on Monday, September 28th. Our salons are typically on a Tuesday, but this one's a Monday for a reason. And it's going to be extremely interactive with cooking. And you're going to be able to pick up some ingredients and cook with a chef. We're not going to announce who the chef is. The social media is going to be doing some sort of contest to see if you can guess who it is. But some lucky guests are actually going to be so interactive that we're going to actually bring you into the stream. And so if you love to cook, you don't have to be good. You just have to love cooking. Uh, be on the alert for that. That's going to be a lot of exciting. Next, we have the answers. Still, Jonathan, do you want to pull up the answers of who has the most views online? And 25% of you guessed Randy Lewis and 75% said Jill Davis. Well, one person with 1.4 million views was Dr. Daria Long. She's been featured on the TED.com website. And next up is the winner. So most of you got it right is Daryl Davis. And I believe today he's at 8.6 million views, which is amazing. We were excited when we got the first 500,000. We were even more excited when we hit 1 million. And 8.6 million is just incredible. If you haven't seen his talk, just go to TED, go to YouTube, TEDx Naperville, Daryl Davis, and you'll see it. And if you want to have a lot of fun, read the comments. And he's the example about trolls typically typically live in the comment sections on the internet, but not with Daryl Davis. The, the comments are just as powerful as his talk. Before I introduce this guest, we're going to open up our first interactive poll on the app. And Jonathan, if you want to get that started. And it's going to be a word cloud. And when you think of neuroscience, think of what words come to mind. And this is a question from our speaker. And we're going to give you a minute or two to fill in these words. Think as many as you want. And I'm going to get ready to introduce our guest this evening. Dr. Moran Surf is a neuroscientist and business professor at the Kellogg School of Management and the Neuroscience Program at Northwestern University. He is also a member of the Institute on Complex Systems. He holds a PhD in neuroscience from Caltech, a Master of Arts in Philosophy, which is interesting, and a Bachelor of Science in Physics from Tel Aviv University. He has numerous patents, has published over 60 academic papers, and much of his research is available to the public domain. And we really appreciate how he gives back to the public and, and organizations such as TEDx Naperville to share his precious time with us and with you. I'd like to introduce Dr. Moran Sir. Welcome. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, not in person, unfortunately, but hopefully uh, in a few months, we actually will be able to make it an even uh, more immersive experience by seeing each other face to face. For now, I'm very happy that it's happening. You kind of let the bag out, let, get the cat out of the, out of the bag yet, but that's okay. Yeah, people don't know that you are going to be one of the speakers this year at TEDx Naperville. Uh, it's not too common to have a speaker invited back, but again, this is just a test. When we talk about getting virtual and getting uh, interactive, uh, Dr. Moran Surf has some really interesting ideas how to get interactive with TEDx Naperville on November 14th, and I'm glad you can be part of that. So while people are filling the word cloud, we talked yesterday briefly, and I, I had a quick question about what's something interesting you're working on, and you said, no, 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 no. Let me answer that tomorrow. So tomorrow's now today, so while people are filling in the word cloud, and before we get started, what is something interesting that you couldn't tell me yesterday? So one thing that we're looking into right now that I won't mention today, so I can tell you uh, just before the talk starts, because the other three I'm going to mention in the talk, 
is a personality and the brain. Basically, the question we ask is, can I have a person sit in the lab, have something on their head that measures brain activity, and have them watch a movie or look at pictures or do something that seems very mundane, and at the same time, give us data from their brain that allows us to say something about personality. So basically, figure out who they are, if they're shy or not, if they're uh, neurotic or not, if their conscientiousness is high, if any, any of the kind of uh, common factors that people use to describe personality, get them by just observing your brain without asking you a single question while you do something else. And that's uh, the remarkable work we're looking at right now that has a lot of applications in terms of hiring, in terms of aligning teams in the companies, in terms of therapy, and in terms of even understanding ourselves. So everyone can go study their brain and get some readings of who they really are at a very young age even. So that's something I wasn't gonna share before, but figured that I'm gonna tell you right now. That scares the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you said that because I'm gonna end my uh, short talk today by asking people something about what scares them. and and and. and one of the questions that I'm interested in and people can start thinking about right now is whether the advances in neuroscience, the remarkable things we're doing right now, are seen as a fantastic opportunity to understand ourselves better or a creepy, scary thing that actually peers into our brain and tells us something that we don't want to know. And that's kind of where neuroscience is heading. And I think everyone should have an opinion on that very question that you said right away scares you. Yeah, you're scaring me because right now you, you could be finding out how neurotic I am. I don't know <laughs> what's going on. Okay, well, enough of that. The word cloud, I think, is ready. I'm going to turn the show over to you, uh, Dr. Moran Surf, and thank you for being here and take it away. Thank you. So let's see. We have now the word cloud, and now we know uh, what are the words that come to mind. Uh, a lot of brain, a lot of mind, a lot of research, scientists, behavior, neuromapping. Uh, theory and thoughts, mapping appears a different one. And I think that uh, the word that I'm going to uh, start with is mystery. That's the word that I was almost hoping to see because it will tell us something that will drive my talk. And this is that as we explore more about the brain, we're uncovering some of the mysteries of who we are and how we think. And we're beginning to make something that was a mystery accessible to us. And in doing that, we're actually opening up a question that all of us are stuck with uh, every day, which is who is in control? We used to live in a world where we thought that we have control over our thoughts and our, our actions. And more and more, we're realizing that maybe there is something else in our brain that drives our uh, behavior that we have no full control over. And that this mysterious thing that's hiding in the back might be the dominant thing in navigating who we are. So with that premise, I'm going to start by saying a few things that will be just an introduction to the talk, and then I'll take you straight to the main point I wanted to make. So I wanted to start by uh, clarifying, as Arthur said, I'm a neuroscientist. Uh, I am also a business professor. I spend a lot of time talking to MBA students about how they can use neuroscience in applications in the real world. But a third thing that is uh, less known about me but is relevant for today's talk is that I also spent over a decade uh, of my life as a hacker. My job was to break into banks and to steal money from them and then go to the owners of the bank and say, here's how we did it and here's how you can protect yourself from the villains that might come in the future. So I had a firsthand uh, view to how vulnerable our world is when it comes to security online. And what I'm doing right now is asking questions about the security and the vulnerability of our own mind. Can someone get inside our head and change thoughts that are deep inside and navigate our behaviors in different direction? And what I wanna talk about today are a couple of ideas from neuroscience that are uh, relatively new. They're all emerging in the last couple of years that I think will uh, expose the vulnerability of our brain and tell us something about how easy it is to change things and how we should think about that in the years to come. But the title of this talk was The Brain and the Pandemic. And I did want to start by speaking for a minute about the brain and loneliness or the brain and uh, having no access to other people. And before I do that, I wanted to open with another word cloud question that you can answer while I talk about it. And that is the question, what did you miss most 
during the pandemic time? So here's a, another word card question. You can start typing things, but you had now, or some of you nine, some of you six months of essentially being isolated in various ways. I wanted to ask the question, what did you miss most during the pandemic time? So you can start typing your answers. Uh, while I uh, apologize right away and explain something that I think uh, will be important for all of us, and that is that uh, some of you might experience buffering issue and you think that the internet is not working well and you hear things rapidly going, it's not your computer, it's actually how I speak. So I speak fast, uh, I get told that all the time when I speak in class and over the internet it's double uh, difficult. So I wanted to reassure you that I'm doing my best to uh, keep myself slow, but at the same time, uh, if you do feel that things are going uh, very, very fast, there's this uh, a button you can press that slows down things on your end and you can just hear me in slow motion. While we do that, we're getting some words uh, about people telling us what they're missing during the pandemic. Let's see. Uh, we see uh, someone saying that they're missing social interactions, someone saying that they're missing closeness, connectedness, uh, working, touching, uh, feeling healthy, uh, interaction, and I think that most of you are hitting the word that I was trying to uh, aim at right away. Isolation is difficult for us in many ways, but one of the ways that it's particularly hard for us is uh, the fact that our brain needs, likes, craves social interactions. And we always knew that. We always knew that people are a social animal, that we thrive when we're together, that a lot of our achievements as a species came from the ability to actually share thoughts and work together. But the last couple of years of research have shown us that, in fact, there is a unique, remarkable talent that humans have, which is we can imagine a thought in one brain and actually share it with another brain and have communication about that and have the ability to interact and build on this idea without the idea being part of reality. What I mean by that is that one person can conceive of something that doesn't exist, like unicorns, and he or she can describe it to another person so well that the other person can actually see this unicorn inside their mind and they can actually work together to work on drawing unicorns, building movies that are based on unicorns, talking about stories that are built on unicorns. We can actually share ideas as a species, even though these ideas are not real. Think about democracy. Democracy is not a real thing that you can wear or eat. It's a real thing in everyone's mind because we created this idea and we can work around it, but it doesn't exist anywhere. We, as far as we know, are the only animal that can actually do that, that can actually create things that are not necessarily there, share them among brain and operate as a team around those ideas, even if those ideas are not in anywhere, something that we can see, hear, smell, feel, uh, eat, experience or interact with. And this thing made our species particularly dependent on each other. In fact, one of the things that always amazes me is uh, how our brain tries to fight loneliness internally. So one of the stories that I like the most, the story of Alcatraz, the, the famous prison in San Francisco, that was at the time the place that uh, had the worst criminals on earth uh, uh, located in. In this prison, where you were surrounded by the worst people, uh, murderers and rapists and burglar and, and really the, the, the worst people, still the biggest punishment you can receive if you behave badly was to be taken away from those people and be put alone in a solitary confinement with your own brain without anyone else. So you can take a person from the worst people on earth and put them alone with their brain and it's regarded a punishment because somehow everyone knew even back uh, when the prisons were uh, structured that being alone with our mind and away from society is not just a thing that protects society, it's actually a punishment. It's something that makes our brain start interacting with itself without inputs. And as the brain does that, what we're seeing is that for a while it runs out of ideas and then at some point it starts actually creating ideas from within that are not part of reality. A lot of accounts of prisoners who were sent to solitary confinement for a while in Alcatraz report the fact that they basically became delusional after a few days without human interactions. What happened to their brain is that lacking in input from the outside world, it started to manufacture content from the inside. And at some point, 
this content overwhelms the brain so much that what we think is that the things that are in our mind are reality. So people in prison that were in confinement were describing themselves actually being out of prison in a place full of people playing with kites, looking at uh, animals, all kinds of things that were not true that their brain created because it was lacking input. And in fact, what we learn about the brain is that it so need inputs that in many ways, having inputs is one of the sources of happiness. And what I wanted to ask you uh, is another question that will kind of drive a conversation. If I were to describe to you the things that make people happy, there are many things that can make you happy uh, among the ones that people uh, figured was uh, important in the beginning and turned out to not be true was money. A lot of people, when asked in surveys, what do you think it correlates with happiness the most? People said money. If I were a little bit richer, I would be happier. And it turns out this is not the case. But I wanted, before I tell you, to ask you, what do you think are the top five things that make people happy? So again, we can have a word cloud and we can type questions and type answers. And the question again is, if you were to guess, what are the top five things that make us happy? What would those be? And when we get the answer, I will say that, as you probably guessed from the buildup, number two in this list, the second from the top, is social interaction. Our brain loves social interaction. And what's important about that is that the brain doesn't need interaction to be bidirectional, as it, it needs to have someone else that we can talk to. I see that Arthur is here, so let's see yep. if we have. Motivation. Slight, slight issue, a uh, slight bit of humanity uh, affecting us. Some people we're, we're recognizing, some people on the polling app are stuck at the first question. So if you are uh, trying to do that, go to the comments section on YouTube, not, not the Facebook. We prefer the YouTube. That's our primary. But put your comments of the word cloud into the YouTube comments until we get this fixed. Jonathan's going to work feverishly on that. And if, if it's OK, I just want to ask one question while, while John, uh, to give John Jonathan a little bit of leeway to fix this technical issue. Your, your hacking experience, is it okay if I mentioned your previous somewhat celebrity about hacking? About I don't know what it is, but please do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this somebody, it's your, your moth performance on hacking. Uh, for the general audience, uh, Moron mentioned his hacking experience. If you want to have, the moth is, is that uh, uh, public radio where people get on stage and they share stories. And he has a great story about his hacking experience. And honestly, I can tell you, it's one of the, the one of the better moth stories, if not the top five. Uh, very entertaining, very adventurous, and it explains. It's almost unbelievable if you're like when you said what you're paid to do. It, it's a so just go to YouTube or Google the moth uh, more on surf, and you'll have a, a, a great time watching an excellent. You're an excellent storyteller. I've got to give you that. Uh, great storytelling. It's funny. But, no matter what I do as a neuroscientist. I always will be, for the most of the world, a hacker, because that's the first thing that you find when you look my name online. So I'm going to always do it. You are. So I'm going to turn it back over to you with the word cloud. It looks like things are slowly get going, and hopefully the next one, we're back to normal. But you can take me out, Jonathan, and Moran, please continue. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Let's see what it is. So people had the chance to guess what are the top five things. And indeed, uh, what you see here is love, freedom, family, passion, purpose. It just becomes a little bit smaller. Uh, uh, to me, structure, purpose again, security, uh, friends. Okay, so so you hit a, a, a number of important things, and you hit none of the four things that are uh, missing on the top five, besides the one that I mentioned, which is the social interaction. So I'll let you keep putting those while I talk about social interaction, and then we'll try to see if any of you guess the other four, and then I'll just tell you what they are. Social interaction, which is number two, as I said, is interesting because it doesn't really require us to interact as in for both of us to speak. What we learn about interaction is that even if I speak to someone and they just look at me and they say nothing, they don't say a single word, maybe they nod with their hands, or they don't even do that, they just sit there and they listen to me, my talking to them requires my brain to actually think of the same ideas differently because it tries to make sure that the other person is communicated, is communicated to properly. So I would think of an idea as if I'm seeing it for the first time when I talk to someone else and reshape the word and make it so it's as clear as possible as I can make it when I deliver it. And in that sense, there's something about the difference between I speak to you and you don't say a word, or I'm alone in the room and I say the same thing because you being there in front of me makes my brain think like it's outside of itself. 
and shape ideas differently. And in a way, this is what social interaction gives us. It gives us a way to take our own thoughts and reshape them. That's what the brain loves it so much, because it's a way to actually process and do what the brain likes the most, which is to change, adapt, evolve. Now that we know that number two is social interaction, let's see if any of you guessed the other uh, four. I see a lot of things here that are really, really uh, important, like security, and like love, So number five. Oops. It, it's it's not good when you see my face, is it? <laughs> I, I assume that there's some technical thing, but actually I, I I'm happy with the way the others. So, so let's no, now you sound great. We were getting a lot of audio issues and a good chunk of that. I was gonna ask you, can you hack into somebody else's Wi-Fi? And get, get audio up? issues as in my computer is making I, uh, sounds? Yeah, we think it might be on your end. Uh we were that that's our guess. Uh, again, this is an experiment for everybody. And some of that was garbled. It seems to be coming in much better now. So now it seems to be working. I don't know if it was, we're not sure what, what ended. I just wanted to make sure I let you know that, but now it seems to be working. So I'll let you go back and continue. So maybe it's just my voice that's garbled uh, when I speak normally. Uh, so here are the top uh, five things that uh, lead to happiness. Number five, at the bottom of the, of the five, is a, 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 sorry, exercising. So exercising is actually affecting our brain hormonally. It changes things in our brain. And people report, I should say, all of the things I'm going to say, say right now are coming from people reporting their happiness. So they do things, and someone asks them, how happy are you on a scale of 1 to 10? And we see what are the things that are at the top. That If you do them, your ranking is highest. And it turns out exercising is one of those drivers. So having a, some activity makes our brain feel that it's getting uh, the nutrients that it needs or the hormones that it needs, and it just changes our happiness level. So that's, of course, not surprising to many of us, but it is the case. Number four, and that is something that I find important and, and interesting uh, for a lot of us in a community like the TEDx community, and that is volunteering. Doing things for others makes us happy. That's the payment that our brain takes for doing things for others, uh, the happiness. And in many ways, this is something that a lot of us know intuitively, but if we put our mind to it, we'll see how important it is. As an exercise, I suggest one day, when you're feeling tired or a little bit down, go out and do something for others and come back and see how you feel. The science suggests that you will actually feel happy and you, before you go out, you will think no chance that now that I'm tired, going out and doing something for others is actually going to make me happy more than just relaxing and watching a movie or putting my mind away from uh, the troubles of the day. But the reality is that out of many things you can do to take your mind away from those things that trouble you, going out and helping others and coming back will be important and it will increase your happiness. In fact, a colleague of mine had a nice study where he compared a money and happiness because a lot of people still when they get asked what will make you happy say money and there's this famous saying uh, money doesn't buy happiness that you may have heard he actually ran a study that uh, had people spend money on others so take the money that you're given but spend it on others and what he shows is that if you do that it actually does buy you happiness so the the title of his of his uh, talk is if money doesn't buy you happiness you're spending it the wrong way because you're spending it on yourself. If you spend it on others, it will buy you happiness. So that's number four, volunteer and helping others. Number three, very interesting and uh, somewhat controversial by a lot of my colleagues, is uh, that being spiritual uh, and specifically being religious actually increases our happiness a lot. So people that are spiritual, people that believe that uh, there is something bigger, that there's some meaning, that there's some uh, bigger story to our world tend to be happier. Unfortunately, this is one of those things that you cannot fake. As in, you can't just say, okay, if that's the case, then I'm gonna actually believe right now. You have to really believe that there is a purpose, that there is meaning, that there is something that is bigger than us in this world. And if you do that, then your happiness is going to rise up. And what I like about this one is that it ties in my mind to number two, because in a way, if number two is social interaction, I think that people who are religious, people that believe that there actually is a bigger meaning to the world, that there is something uh, above just me uh, uh, there, actually feel that they also have someone that they can interact with. So uh, religious people, for the most part, believe that there's actually an entity, a god or someone or something that is out there. And in that sense, if it's really uh, all seeing and, and uh, kind of 
above all of us in a way, then even when you're alone by yourself in bed under the blanket, this God is with you. So I think that the brain of those people likes it because it gives them answer to number two, social interaction. There's always someone watching, listening, looking, and I can always talk to that person. In that sense, I'm never alone. Number two, as I said, was social interaction. And number one, far above all the other four, and the one that you should definitely invest in if you have a chance, is a sleep. Turns out that of all the things that would make us happy, having good sleep changes our happiness significantly more than all the others by about one and a half points on those one to 10 scale. So it turns out that if you wake up in the morning and you're feeling alert, you're feeling that you had a good night's sleep, the remaining of the day, you're gonna be much happier than you were uh, ever before. And if you're waking up and you're feeling not uh, alert, tired, uh, you had a bad sleep, everything else is gonna be colored by that. The important thing to say right now to those new parents right now who have kids and won't have their sleep for the next uh, six to 10 uh, months is that it's not about the amount of sleep. It's not about the amount of hours. It's actually the quality of sleep. So uh, older people usually sleep a lot less hours than younger people. And even with five hours of sleep, if you wake up feeling alert and feeling energized, then it's good. It's not that you have to have nine hours to actually feel good. You have to have good X amount of hours that give you this feeling. So sometimes three hours might be enough. And for some people, even nine are not enough. But the point is that if you're managing to control your sleep and make it such that it actually is a quality one, your happiness is going to rise. So if you have to choose between having, say, $50,000 more to your salary annually or getting an 50 nights of good sleep, if you're concerned about your happiness, then the sleep thing is going to do a much better job. In fact, as a joke, uh, when my students ask me about uh, advice for life, I tell them that the best advice I can give them is to sleep the way to the top because uh, that's where a lot of their happiness lies. And the reason I said all of that is because during the pandemic, many of us were uh, deprived from the social interactions. And what we're learning is that this has long-term effect, not just on the day-to-day -day, on how we feel, but also on how our brain processes information. A study that came out uh, recently from colleagues of mine looked at one of the few groups in the world that you can study to understand how loneliness affects our brain. And those were a NASA astronauts preparing for the mission to Mars. See, at some point, we're gonna send astronauts to Mars to try to land on the planet and uh, explore it. Going to Mars is a eight months journey. Coming back is another eight months. So these people are gonna end up spending about 16 months back and forth to Mars and back in a small chamber the size of this uh, room that I'm sitting in right now with two, three other people alone without a lot of communication with the outside world. Unlike uh, landing on the moon where the distance is relatively close, where you can, you know, you can land and have a problem and say, Houston, we have a problem, please uh, help us. Uh, when you go to Mars, if you even have a problem and you broadcast this problem to Houston, it takes about three to four minutes to the information getting on one direction and then three more to, the, to it getting back. You can't really rely on the outside world to help you. Everything has to be solved internally. And that is why these people are going to be alone in the most direct, immediate way for a while. Now, NASA is wanting to prepare for that. They want to ask the question, will these people be able to not lose their mind when they're doing this journey? So they actually collected uh, data for a number of astronauts preparing and training for these missions. And neuroscientists can actually look now at the brain of people that are put in a chamber for a number of months without outside communication as a training for this and tell us something about what happens to the brain. And the answer, as I alluded to in the first point, is that it's not good for the brain. The brain likes interaction. So at the absence of physical meetings right now, and despite the fact that many of us say, oh, I had enough uh, of uh, these Zoom meetings and so on, what I would advise is that you try to engage in a few of those as much as you can, even uh, if you feel right now that just kind of letting yourself do things and, and dealing with the here and now might be a better idea because your brain loves it. And this is a food for your brain, this interaction that will actually help you maintain the properties of the brain in interaction. This is my first point. The second one I want to talk about ties to my hacking experience. And it's about another work we're doing, we're doing right now that I thought would be interesting to people because it will shape, I think, in many ways, how we interact in a world that becomes more and more digital. 
And that is a work that looks at uh, security or hacking in the brain. So as many of you know, uh, there are movements by a lot of uh, colleagues of mine and, and people in Silicon Valley to get to a point where we can actually put a chip inside people's brain that will help us. The idea is that we open your brain, we put a neural implant that interacts with your brain, and suddenly you have this ultimate brain machine interface. You can control your computer just by thinking. You can control your car just by thinking. You can order food from delivery just by thinking about the food you want, and suddenly the chip in your brain talks to the internet, orders something, and the food arrives uh, later on. When you drive your car, if you want to navigate to a place and you don't know, instead of uh, thinking that you need to navigate, taking your phone, the GPS, typing the address and getting information on the phone that then goes to your brain and navigates your car, you'll be able to just think that you need to know how to get to Leicester Square in London. Your chip in the brain will access the maps software after, get information. Suddenly, we just know that you need to make a right and a left and another right afterwards. Suddenly, the blurry line between what you know and what the outside world has access to will become even blurrier. And instead of using devices to give us information, those devices will be in our brain and our thoughts will become part of this thing. And what I'm concerned about as a former hacker is whether those things could be hacked. Whether someone can get inside your chip and change something in your mind such that you will have a thought that seems to you like it's yours, that came from you, but actually it's a thought that someone else planted in, inside. And as a hacker, I can say right away that if it's digital, if it has access to the internet, it's hackable. Someone can hack it. And if it's hackable, someone will hack it. And therefore, I spend a lot of time right now trying to ask the question, can we secure our brains better? Can we teach ourselves somehow ways to know if information inside our head is true or not? Our memories are real or manipulated? And I also ask questions, which is, can we use the brain as the ultimate security machine? Some of you may know that uh, the world of security has those three conditions that are required for full security. We call those the three factor authentication. The one that you probably are all familiar with is password. Uh, you have, say, your email, and you have a password that you can type, and this password gives you access. That's one factor authentication. Some of you use two factor authentication, which is not only do you have a password, but you also have something that actually looks at your phone and sends you a code to your phone. The idea there is that there's something you know, your password, something you have, your phone, and with the phone and with the thing that you know, together you can prove that you are you. A similar example would be your credit card in the bank on the ATM machine. You have the password of the, of the credit card of the ATM that you know, and you also have the actual physical card that you have to insert that has something on it, so something you have and something you know. The third thing that sometimes is used by companies to secure even better is something you are. So there's something you know, your password, something you have, your credit card, something you are would be your fingerprint, your retina. Those things are being used more and more to get us a third layer of security. So if someone wants to hack into your email account, they have to know your password, they have to have your uh, phone, for instance, and they also have to have your fingerprints and your retina. All of those three are used to secure things that are really, really uh, highly important, and we want to not have anyone get into them. The thing about it is that the brain is all three. It's something you are, it's something you have, and it's the place where everything we know resides. So if someone can get to your brain, they can actually get every password that is most secure. So what I'm playing with right now is first seeing if we can create passwords that are uh, your brain. As in, we put something on your head, we just measure your brain activity, and you unlock uh, your phone or you unlock your uh, apartment door just by having this device with your brain activity and find signatures that tell us that it's you. And the answer is overwhelmingly yes. We're able to put something on your head and have a person do anything they want. Can play a computer game, they can read a book, they can sleep. There are some patterns in your brain that are so unique to you that even if you do different things, and even though a lot of people's might brains might seem to us like they're processing in the same way. When you get to the level of enough data from one brain, we can detect that you are you in the ultimate way. So there is a way to create this ultimate security thing, which is you won't have to have anything uh, that you remember, a password. You won't have to have anything that someone can take from you because it's your brain, it's you, it's in your head, and you're going to carry it with you everywhere. So that's what we're playing right now, building this ultimate security machine. The out uh, or the negative, the, the outside story about the same thing is that in a way, what we're learning right now is that something you know is the most vulnerable thing. So passwords that are in your brain are actually easily accessible 
Of course, people can actually use complex ways of neuroscience to extract information from the brain, but you don't have to go that far. A gun to your head most of the times is enough. So colleagues of mine, a neuroscientist and computer scientist are right now playing with the idea of planting passwords in your brain that sit there that can be used by you, but you don't know them. So they're actually sitting in your brain, but you can use them without knowing what they are. There's a colleague of mine at Stanford, Dan Bonnet, who did a fantastic work where he showed how you can actually have a person uh, type things, essentially play kind of a game where you see characters falling from uh, on the screen, kind of like a Guitar Hero game where you have to type the character when you see it coming down. And he makes you essentially type a 30, password, 30 character password very rapidly and you get points for being rapid and for being accurate. And at the end of rehearsing that enough times, people get better so much so that they can tomorrow come to the nuclear plant and at the entrance see a screen with the same game, they are playing the game and because they trained for that the, the day before, they somehow muscle, muscle memory train their brain to know the right password and they can open it. And if you take nine other people that didn't train the day before, they can still play the game, but they will be a lot less accurate, a lot uh, less fast. And you can tell about the one person from the other. So what colleagues of mine from Northwestern, including the guys at uh, Stanford were showing is that you can actually plant passwords in your brain through memories that are not accessible to you, muscle memory in this case, that can be used by you. But if someone points a gun to your head and say, give me the password, you don't have, they can't get it from you because you don't really know it. You can only do it when you're faced with the task. Together, those ideas suggest that security is changing, that in the years to come, it might not be a world where passwords are just typed and you have to change them every couple of days or try to use not the same one in all devices because those things fail. In fact, as a hacker, I can tell you, most times, if I hack into one of your accounts, I can just try the same password in the other accounts, and it works. Uh, if I know something about you, I can try to get into your account just by knowing information about you. Those things work. So where we're playing right now is in a world where we can replace passwords with things in your brain that can be used without you knowing them. And to get everyone uh, involved in this conversation again, I wanted to ask a question that uh, would be really useful for me later on when I try to order food. And that is, uh, uh, what is your email password? Let's open a word cloud and everyone can type your email password. I was actually uh, joking when I said it, but let's see if people play around. Let's see if people uh, agree to put their email password. One, two, three, four. That's a very useful one. Thank you, Arthur, for uh, this uh, choice of password. Uh, uh, very important. If you don't want to put your email, you can also put your credit card, debit card, or ATM card passwords. Uh, ha is another one. Uh, ha, one, two, three, four, I think is what I'm seeing. Uh, my passport, uh, password. Okay, I was kind of joking, but let's see how it plays out. Let's see if people actually put uh, their password. Uh, while those come up, I'm going to move to the third and last point I was trying to make, and then we we'll open it for questions. The third uh, uh, point I was trying to make about an uh, interesting thing that uh, neuroscience and is, is looking into right now, and I'm doing a little bit of work in that domain as well, is uh, looking at the one moment that is critical for passwords and for us and it's a moment that you're going to experience only once in your life, and you won't be able to tell much about that afterwards. And that's the moment you die. See, one thing about this uh, password that is in your brain is that we believed when we started this project that the good thing about passwords in your brain is that also they die with you. As in, if you know something, this is a password to the vault, and you don't want anyone to know it, when you die, your brain stops processing, and no one can get this password. So forever, it's safe with you. Unlike your fingerprints, for instance, we have stories that I uh, looked at when I tried to learn about the brain uh, of uh, countries, I think it was in Colombia, where a criminal uh, was killed by the police and then they wanted to unlock his phone and see what are the names of other people. So they actually uh, took his phone and took his finger uh, and used his finger to unlock his phone and then got all the contacts from inside. So in a way, even if you're dead, some things about you are still carrying information that you can use. And what we thought when we started this project, oh, that's pretty uh, uh, good because the brain, when you die, stops processing and everything is safe. Your passwords and your secrets are safe with you. No one can get into them. And then a year ago, we learned that this is not the case. And where neuroscience is playing right now is asking the question, can your brain still do things and process information after you die? So imagine that you die at noon 
and we somehow extract your brain from your head and ask the brain's questions. The brain still has some juice, let's call it, in it. It still can process things. Can we zap the right things and actually get information from your brain? And the answer is yes. In a study by colleagues of mine from Yale uh, from last year, they were able to do that with uh, pigs. So they took pigs who were slaughtered at noon and extracted their brain as soon as they were killed and put this brain in an incubation system that basically feeds into the brain all, all the right nutrients and the blood and, and the right uh, amount of everything. And these brains kept processing as if the pig is still containing them. They could be probed and they would behave in the same way. Circuits were actually creating uh, the, the same outcome, outputs that they were doing when they were inside the pig body. And this opened up a new trajectory of research that me and my colleagues are playing with a bit right now, which is asking the question, can we actually take a person, let's say, we're right now only looking at animals, but that's the engineering question, that died at noon and ask him or her questions for a few more hours. Maybe you can ask grandma, what's the recipe that you always wanted? Maybe you can say goodbye to someone that you didn't get to say goodbye to and know somehow that they're still there to process information. Maybe you can uh, keep the brain of people for a while, uh, not just for hours, and essentially have the full interactive experience with them. You know, imagine uh, how it would change the legal system or the, or, or detective stories. If Sherlock Holmes can just come to uh, the person who died in chapter one of the book and just ask him or her who killed you, the person says it's the butler and the book is over because Sherlock Holmes just got the answer. The idea here is that neuroscientists are playing in a realm that's very, very uh, interesting, which is slowing down, pausing or changing the meaning of death. Now, death meaning has been changing for a while. Go back not long ago, a couple of uh, centuries ago, we used to think that you die when your heart stops pumping or when you stop breathing. Later on, we learned it's not the case. And even the definition of death in our brain has changed significantly in the last 100 years from what parts of the brain we're looking at to understand if you're alive or dead. And over time, I think that neuroscientists are playing with extending life. And what's behind that is our interest in our overwhelming paralysis when it comes to our demise. We all think, OK, like life is only meaning when I'm alive and what would it be to, to not be alive and to exist? In fact, a lot of surveys about people who believe uh, in, in the afterlife uh, still show that they believe a lot of things uh, would happen in their lifetime. Uh, they, they don't want the afterlife to start after they're not there. Like They want things that they care about to happen in this life, even if they believe that there's another one. And in that sense, I think that our society's uh, kind of interaction with death is difficult, flawed, uh, not uh, transparent. We don't tell kids that grandma died. We tell them that the kid went to the farm. And in doing that, we create this uh, inability to tackle the problems directly. And now neuroscientists are paving a new path where they're basically saying, we might be able to keep your brain alive for at least a little after you die. And what it means to society is something that will either change everything or at least give new meaning to life here. And I wanted to end my talk by basically offering what I promised uh, Arthur I'll do uh, in the beginning, which is a chance for all of us to ask the question, do we want it? So neuroscientists are tasked with uh, pushing the envelope, with exploring the wide reaches of the universe when it comes to our brain and understanding what it is uh, better by looking inside and trying to figure out how this machinery works. But society as a whole has to ask the question, do we want it? In many ways, neuroscience is, in my mind, similar to nuclear power. Uh, e equals mc squared was dis discovered uh, by scientists uh, nearly 105 years ago. And when this happened, it paved the road to uh, nuclear power, but also nuclear bombs. And both things sit on the same uh, scientific trajectory. We can use that to power cities in a very, very efficient way or to kill hundreds of people, thousands of people, millions of people uh, with a uh, decision by one person. Science doesn't tell you uh, whether it's good or bad. It just shows you options and society has to choose. So when I give talks oftentimes about the brain, the question that comes to everyone's mind is, are you okay with that? Is it ethical? Is it okay to change people's uh, uh, thoughts and make them choose passwords that weren't their own choice, but yours planted in their brain? Would it be okay uh, for us to halt death and change the meaning of life? And since I thought this is something that 
is not for scientists to answer, but for society, the last question I wanted to ask everyone is not gonna be a word cloud, but it's gonna be actually a numeric question. And I wanted to ask you, if you were in position to approve or deny the research or the concept of neural implantation, if, if we had right now the tool to actually open someone's brain, put a chip inside that will interact with the world, and we'll give the person who contains that access to all of the information out there from Wikipedia to GPS to anything you want, you will know it will be in your brain. But at the same time, it might create the ultimate inequality. It might create people that uh, can communicate without words, but would ignore other people entirely, those who don't have the chip, who cannot actually be part of the conversation. If you were in position to approve or deny neural implantation, would you approve it? One says absolutely not. Seven, absolutely yes. And I wanted to see where people stand on this question. So let's start taking your questions. While I'll uh, tell you that we ran this survey by now with thousands of people all over the world in the last couple of uh, years, two years now. We asked people from different age, gender, race, uh, location, geographies, from Africa to the US, uh, the same question. And as I'm getting your answers, I will also uh, tell you whether you guys, the TEDx sniper population, align with uh, other groups on your thoughts about that. I should say that among, uh, when I give talks about the brain, regardless of what I speak about, whether it's about security or about personality and psychology in the brain, or whether uh, one of many topics, there are three questions that always come up at the end in the Q&A. And one of them is the question of ethics. So I wanted to preempt it by asking you the same question, because when I get asked that, I always say it's not my position to tell you whether the world should or should not have neural implants. I'm researching that and uncovering that. And it's your job as constituents, as voters, as society to decide whether you want it or not. So we can all agree on what world we want. That's democracy. That's not science. Science will tell you whether it's possible or not. And civilization decides how to approach it. So uh, let's see what are the answers we uh, have for the, for the question. I see that we have only a few. Let's see what, uh, what are the answers that we're converging on. OK, so it seems to me that uh, there are kind of two uh, locations, the one and five. Uh, so the results seem to skew towards uh, absolutely approve. Uh, if I do the average kind of visually by eye, it seems that there's a number of you who said absolutely not. But if you look at the uh, accumulated sum, it seems that you sit somewhere around the 5.5, let's say, when it comes to approving it. So Ted and Snapperville actually uh, is not aligned with uh, most of the people we asked, uh, even though in my talks I oftentimes elaborate on the positive aspects and how important it is and how great it is. Indeed, most people we ask say that they would not want it. And the primary reason they say that they would not want it is inequality. They say, and I tend to agree with that statement, that most likely neural implants will become something that only certain people would be able to get, and it will be accessible first to the rich and the powerful. And if that's the case, it will make those people even more rich and even more powerful, and they will give them access to something that others would not have, and it might create inequality that we have never seen before. Not only will it have inequality in terms of money, which is where we are right now, it will be inequality when it comes to thinking. There will be smarter people with abilities that others do not have, and that will change everything on how we think. They might actually fork into two species that just don't want to talk to each other if some species are only interacting with one way mentally and the others do not. So I personally can share with you later on the questions my opinion on that, but I think that it's interesting to see how the world is divided on those questions and that specifically inequality is viral for that. So with that, I'm gonna stop here. The three ideas I wanted to share with you are the ideas of security in the brain, implants, loneliness, and happiness uh, as one that I think are important to think about when it comes to what neuroscientists uh, are giving us right now. And I wanted to end by uh, putting out there the quote that to me is the one that helps me think about those topics again and again, which is, don't believe everything you think. The thoughts that are in our mind are no longer a, a safe zone. They themselves might be exposed to changes and to vulnerability. And if we get used to thinking about thinking and asking ourselves, am I consistent with previous thoughts or not, we'll be able to live in a world that might actually make our own mind exposed to others. Thank you. Questions? Yes. 
<laughs> you you had me scared, and then you had me really scared, and then that last quote like really <laughs> scared me the most. Don't believe everything you think. Oh, good boy. You know, I have this uh, game that I sometimes play uh, uh, when I when I talk to people, and, and questions kind of go on beyond the say ten minutes that we leave for questions. I tell people, here's what we're gonna do. I, you know, up to now I drank a glass of uh, water while I was uh, giving a talk to make sure that I'm uh, sounding normally. But uh, what we do normally is I let people ask questions, and if they ask a really good question, I offer them a glass of uh, whiskey or gin or, or rum to. Uh, to get kind of reward for a good question that I'm answering. Since we're not in the same place, I'm going to do it myself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour myself a glass of a, a high alcohol beverage, and I'll take questions. And really good questions will get me drinking a sip of this thing. So hopefully the answers will uh, graduate, uh, uh, in, uh, gradually increase in the level of intimacy. Well, questions? Here's your first question. It's from Susan Riley. As I live alone, I have to had to figure out ways to be social and still stay safe. I think we may have a new kind of failure to thrive in those of us who do live alone. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? So I, th I think that uh, it's it's challenging and, and a challenge uh, to, to be alone. I think that we live in an amazing time in a sense that unlike people in 1918 who were actually isolated and couldn't see other people, we have technology. Essentially the internet that was built since the 60s to the 90s in different forms was made for that. The idea of people develop the internet was that at some point there might be a wall that will cancel all ways of communication and we still should create another network that allows us to communicate. We have that. So I think that what is amazing about the world we have right now is that we have technology that allows us to do things, to see people interact with them. It doesn't cater to all the senses. We know that the sense of smell, the sense of touch are necessary for communication to be complete and we don't have those right now. But absent of those, I think that it's important to use your time, if you live alone, if you're far from everyone else, to force yourself to interact online with people just to make your brain think about things differently and not let it decay into ruminations that are internal alone. I think I, I like what you said there, and I, I like I like how you said force yourself. I think that that's a challenge. I think a lot of people understand that the internet's there. There's there's almost too much information, but it's getting outside that comfort zone where it's like, all right, I'm going to be out there with, with strangers. I did, a, I did a Zoom networking thing, which I would normally never do with 500 people. I'm like, oh God, this is gonna be awful. And, and that was actually kind of cool. <laughs> so I think what I like about this, so, so I, I as, as a professor, um, teaching quite a, quite a bit in the last couple of uh, months in different forms, one of the things that I do a lot is I use breakout rooms. They exist in all kinds of softwares to basically take my students and put them together without me for 20 minutes at a time and just let them talk to each other. Don't get it where, just talk like part of the class is to do it. It turns out it's really, really important for them. And suddenly also the experience of the entire, say, one and a half hour class becomes positive because they had a chance to speak, to express themselves, to interact with other people. If you craft it correctly, to even meet new people that they didn't meet before. There are good things about this, this technology that are helping people. They help introverts meet other people, which might be harder for them in the real world. So I think that we should see the good thing and we should definitely, like you said, force ourselves. We should not spend too much time without uh, without interaction. And that's such a great question that I am gonna take a sip for uh, the question, Susan, thank you. All right, Jonathan, if you wanna pull up another question. From Hazel Wagner, how can a person improve the quality of their sleep? Great, yeah, I, need, I need to know this one. Okay, so, so uh, we talk about the easy ones. Uh, in, First of all, as a scientist, I would say measure. First, before you even start, know something. So measure how many hours you sleep, when you go to sleep, uh, how much alcohol do you consume before you go to sleep, how many, when do you eat, like just knowing those things. And then when you have this diary that you keep for say 10 days, but your sleep and try seeing how well is your sleep and how does it correlate those things. If you see that every time you had uh, two glasses of wine before you went to sleep, you slept poorly, that's this uh, indication that maybe something should change there. So a lot of, Step one is just to measure. There are tons of tools out there that you can buy and use, but even the basic diary that you keep for say 10 days, every night you put some kind of numbers on your sleep. And in the morning you ask the question, how well did I sleep one to 10? Will be helpful to start seeing things that are there that you just don't notice. Then there are all kinds of layer two things which are still easy to do, which is monitor the environment. As in, you know, darkness as much as you can, quiet as much as you can, uh, consistency, go to sleep in the same hours, all of those things are very helpful to the brain. 
also screen time and uh, food time. So if you uh, avoid certain foods before you go to sleep, then the body doesn't need to digest them and you can fall asleep easier. Uh, if you uh, remain, uh, if you don't uh, use particular lights just before you go to sleep, it's gonna be easier for you to fall asleep. If So so those are, are by now known. I mean, I, I mean, you don't need me to tell you that even though uh, humans are the only animal in nature that delays sleep. So you do need me to tell me that, that in the sense that uh, a lot of us know that it's important and still fail to actually do that because they oh, just one more email or I'll wake up in the morning and do one more thing so I'm gonna sleep less hours. We we know that it's bad for us and we still do that. So in that sense, paying attention to it is really important. And then level three, and that's the one that not everyone can have access to, but is really important, is actually use neuroscience to understand your sleep better and, and, and perfect it. So if you came to my lab, and we actually measured your sleep, we could tell you not just whether you fell asleep and woke up after seven hours and so on, we can actually look at your sleep diagram. It's, it's when did you uh, go into deep sleep? When did you uh, go into light sleep? When did you start dreaming and so on? And understanding that gives us access to how your brain actually processes the, say, seven hours of sleep in the brain. And we can do things when you're awake to change that. So if we can turn some lights at 3 p.m. that will fool your brain to thinking that it's a little bit later or earlier, and then it will actually start zoning and getting tired later in the evening. So you'll fall asleep straight into deep sleep. There are things to do. Sleep labs are a fantastic way to understand your sleep. They become more and more common. There are more and more companies and products that are actually doing part of the job. So if you can afford, if you have the time, the energy, the money, the resources to do that, I think this will help you uh, perfect your sleep. But most people will stay at number one and two, and it's a very good, Thing already to just care about sleep, and just to to, just to follow up on that one thing, I find it fascinating that you're such a technical hacker person, and the very first step was a diary, which is interesting. But with with all the with all the movement towards mindfulness and and inner peace and meditation, would you still argue that you're you're better off spending that time on your sleep first and then get into being mindful, or do they play with each other? Yes, I was going to say they play with each other. So so in a way. Uh, I'm, I'm working on a, on a uh, risky terrain here because uh, mindfulness is such a big kind of thing that people hear a lot of things here. They, they, it goes from yoga to uh, praying to Vishnu every night and anywhere in between as all part of the same thing. And it's not for the same, the brain is not the same thing. Uh, there are a lot of things that would uh, activate processes in the brain that will be sleep-like. Meditation is sleep-like. Uh, hypnosis, work for some people is sleep-like lucid dreaming, nap, they are all kind of components of sleep. And I would say they're all good. So any way you can let your brain actually rest and process at some point is useful. And I think that here I would argue for people to uh, try what's working for them. Some people really do a good job when they are able to, you know, spend 10 minutes with themselves in the morning and in the evening and just ruminate. Some people hate that. This causes them anxiety and that's actually the worst thing for them. Now they, they can't sleep because their mind is just racing with chores that they have to do. So I think that each person has their own thing. And I think that at the very least, do it mindfully, like pay attention to it. Just, just like, yes, like do, do, do others, just try to figure out what works for you. That helps. Do, we, do you have time for a couple more questions? I have, a, as long as I have a, a gin in my a glass, we can stay here and ask more questions. So Jonathan, if you want to pull up another question from uh, from the viewers. And while he's pulling that up, oh, here we go. It's from Michelle Nixon. Are there areas or abilities of our brain that we can access that we don't access now? So yes. Uh, uh, so generally, if you think about the brain, uh, and in a very, very figurative way, there's like three things in the brain. There's the part of the brain that is the most accessible to us, the part where we do math, the part where we speak, control our, our limbs, the part that we have full control over. There's a part that we have zero control over. That's the part that uh, makes us hungry, the part that makes us uh, breathe. It's part of our brain that controls our breathing, that makes us hungry, makes us tired, that makes us wake up, and so on. We have no control. We can't say, now it's time to be hungry, let's turn hunger on feel hungry, let's turn it off right now, or, or I don't wanna be, I don't wanna eat right now, so I'm gonna turn hunger off. This this doesn't work like this. It just happens to us and we're just uh, observers of this part of the brain. And there's the in-between, which is the emotion part. Emotions are things that we can have some control over, but not full. We can give 
feed, informa feed the information in, into our brain that makes us sad or happy, and you can regulate emotions. But to some extent, they also happen to us. We kind of expose to things, like we get sad. We, we, we don't choose to be sad right now and, and are sad. So in that sense, they lie in between. Up to now, we definitely had control over the first one, the one that we have full control over, the, the language and the actions. We had some control of the second one and very little one of, of the third one, the one that controls breathing and so on. Right now, neuroscientists are actually playing with this one. They do invasive things, including putting devices in our head that connect the control part to the third part, to the part that actually is the intrinsic internal one. They teach people to control their own mind. I was part of a study that basically looked at a version of that, where we try to give people feedback from the breathing part of their brain into the active part of the brain, and they actually learn to do things that control their breathing. So they're not not how you breathe internally, not the, not the inhale and exhale, but actually how your brain processes breathing and makes you ventilate, uh, hyperventilate, or, or, or uh, hypoventilate. So we can actually start playing with that. This was a proof of concept that, that shows that if you actually wire things from the controlled part to the controlling part, you can change the brain. Whether it's good or bad, a big question that we don't know the answer to yet. So we can, and we don't know if we should. Great question. Oops, I think that you became mute. Or... But that's a great question as well, also, the mute one. And I'm going to elaborate on this one. Uh, let's go with uh, Danja Prokovic. Have you researched how the personality types are reflecting on the happiness level derived from social interactions? I have not, but others have. So, so personality type uh, is a psychologist's way of taking a person and classifying them kind of quickly into one of certain kind of categories. Uh, I mentioned a few. There's a classical kind of breakdown it's called the Big Five. It talks about the agreeableness, neuroticism, consciousness, uh, extroversion. And so, like five attributes. And each of those five attributes, someone made kind of different uh, comparisons of happiness, of wealth, health, and so on, and showed which one of those contributes to happiness. So the answer, I can summarize the entire 50 years of research, is that there is absolute correlation between some attributes and uh, happiness. But the good news and bad news about that is that those characteristics are pretty much rigid. At some point between the age of 0 to 10, your personality gets kind of created. And from then on, you can change very little to your personality. You can behave differently, but who you are at the heart of identity is very hard to change. So if you want to focus on happiness, personality is actually one of the things that will be hard to change. So you might focus on the other five that I mentioned to actually make you happy. Interesting. And I want to summarize a question from Amal Khatrib. It's, it's, a, it's a long question, but they're talking about understanding the use of implants for disease purposes, You know, for treating epilepsy, Alzheimer's, but they're 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 asking about the argument that it would make us less happy as a species uh, if it's used for lifestyle comfort. So, you know, what are your thoughts on that ethically and as a researcher when you have the science helping people versus lifestyle? What are your thoughts on that? So, mixed. So the, the answer is we don't know. So we 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 can guess based on historical experiences that technology will change some things. But we don't know if it's going to be good or bad, or if it makes us happy or unhappy. I think that uh, we can take past experiences and say what they did. But I think that uh, this one is as hard for me, the scientist, because I really feel that it's interpretable. As in, you can ask the question, did the internet make us happy or not? Well, it definitely changed things. It escalated a lot of processes. And it led to a lot of unhappiness among others and to happiness among some. And uh, and for the same person, a use of it could be happy or not. So I don't think that neural implants themselves are going to be uh, the cause of happiness or not. But I think like a lot of technologies, uh, if we correctly steer them in the right direction, we can make them make we can make them help society and make us happy. And without any control, if we just let them kind of go away, I think they will make us unhappy. Interesting. And and I don't know if Jonathan can pull this one up. We have a question from Jeff. Uh, yeah, I like this one. For those of us who at least believe we prefer to be alone, really alone, is that more along the line of perhaps illness? No, 
so so first of all i i think that uh, it's it's a question of ratio so i think that uh, there are introverts and those people actually benefit from time alone they they uh, get their energy from alone time uh, so so i think that there's a, a kind of good um, way to think about it which is the difference between loneliness and isolation and that is a, a, a technical thing that neuroscientists are, are uh, defining when they run the studies you can be with other people and feel alone or you can be alone and feel not lonely and i'll give you an example uh, one of the uh, subjects in a study that i'm involved with uh, is an uh, older man who lost his wife so the wife died in old age and he's now uh, without her surrounded by his friends so this person if you objectively look at the number of people he's interacting with every day it's dozens he's not alone but if you ask him he says he's lonely because since his wife died he feels that no one can fill the gap that he has in his life and in that sense he feels that the more interactions he has the more lonely he feels so this person is nicely talking about the uh, difference between loneliness and isolation he's not isolated but he's lonely contrary to that you can think of people that are actually in the opposite con condition they're lonely and they're not isolated or, or sorry this one they're, they're isolated and not lonely because they need because all they need is the uh, time with themselves and the ability to ruminate i think that what we know at the brain is that the brain needs input if you can get this input in various ways that will not make you feel lonely you're good to go so introverts many times they're not just sitting and not doing anything they're actually choosing to spend time with a few group of a smaller group of people they rely on content coming from books and computer games and a lot of like studies show different things and those things are a, a proxy for social interaction that works for them the breakdown of population shows that they're the minority so there are a lot more people that thrive from actually human social interaction so that's kind of the the group that most of the studies are done but if you're in the small minority people that really get better experiences from not seeing people then then it's a minority but you should actually embrace that but the key thing is that you should ask yourself am i lonely or am i just isolated if you're lonely that's a problem interesting we're gonna bring this to a close i, I really want to thank you so much for being part of this and jonathan's going to bring up uh, a banner so if people want to find out more about you uh, your website is just the tip of the iceberg of, of your fascinating of everything that you're working on. But when the leadership team heard that you'd be willing to, to partake in a discussion, we were super excited just for our own selfish purposes, but the ability to share this with the TEDx community. And, and this talk will stay live on the YouTube and the Facebook for people. The most people view this as a reshare. Uh, I did figure out a hack to your system though. <laughs> I'm going to start a religion of a lot of people and our whole goal is to volunteer to sleep for people. So it's like, we're going to be the happiest people ever, but you really, you, man, you really got uh, me thinking. And I, I think a lot of people out there, but I know you're saying some really fascinating things. I really want to keep track of your website because this whole thing about death and, and what is consciousness, what is death? But then you're saying, don't believe everything you think. And then you say, we don't know. So <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what to make of it. All the buzzwords. I, I, did, I just forgot to mention AI, blockchain, and the cloud, uh, and everything. I would cover all the buzzwords in one uh, talk. Yeah, and, and a lot of what you're talking about reminds me of the movie Inception. If anybody's seen that, where the only way to, to hack the password is you have to create a false reality where the person thinks they're doing what you just... It's really mind-blowing. And it's, it has to be exciting for you to be in this field of that's, that's changing so much. But... Uh, to bring this to a close, I do want to thank uh, the, the our sponsor, uh, Lab Z. Um, and Jonathan might bring that up really quickly. If you're looking, if you if your organization has a boring uh, Zoom call, Zoom event, and you want it to be more interactive, uh, email curious at labz.io. Uh, some of the people working here are are, are part of this organization. Uh, and just remind everybody on September 28th, we on Monday we're going to have our next salon, which is going to be an interactive cooking, and you can remove that. Uh, Jonathan, thank you so much. And uh, November 14th uh, is TEDx Naperville. It'll probably be in the afternoon. And and Dr. Moran Surf is going to be a presenter. And again, when I say presenter, it's not going to be your typical uh, Zoom type of, we're going to do something very interactive. And you got a good snippet of, of how, how Moran thinks. And we're going to be really using that his his creativity to do something really cool uh, with TEDx Naperville. Uh, but any any closing remarks? Anything you have that you want to share with, with our audience? 
I mean, you already gave people my uh, website, so I will just say, if you really want to talk to me, uh, look at my, my, my MySpace page. <laughs> no, thank you really for hosting that. I, I, Do you I, really have a MySpace page? Is, is there, <laughs> that would be pretty cool, actually, if you had one. <laughs> now I should build one, because now we, uh, I, I, I just want to think, because I think that I think it's really important for me as a scientist to get the science to not just other colleagues of mine, but actually to have people vote, share ideas, think about it, and, and, and use it outside of the academic kind of uh, bubble. So this was particularly important for me, and I'm glad we had the chance to talk about it together this evening. Thank you for, Thank all you for sharing, sharing your knowledge. And, and that's it for our slog. We went a little bit late today. We apologize. But definitely, if you enjoyed this conversation, share the links on the YouTube and the Facebook groups with, with other people. Uh, so they can learn more about uh, Dr. Moran Surf. And thank you, everybody. Thank you, Moran. Thanks, uh, Jonathan, in the studio in Nashville. And thank you to everybody else. And thank, uh, thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Human beings, we're wired to be connected. From birth, we look for that connection.